Uh, so next we have Dan Urofsky, uh, who is an assistant professor in the psychology department here at CMU and uh, where he directs the communication and learning lab. And his lab studies uh, the context from which the children learns language, uh, learn language. And uh, Dan receives his PhD in cognitive science from Indiana University and his BS in computer science from CMU as well. And so uh, we're quite excited to have Dan because his work is right at the intersection of the topics that are relevant for, his workshop, for this workshop. So uh, his uh, lab uses empirical studies, corpus analysis, and computational models in order to uh, resolve this puzzle. But the interesting thing is that um, language acquisition is actually reframed as a coordination problem, uh, where uh, his lab investigates this problem not about study, not by studying how children learn language, but actually how parents and children uh, construct language together. So with that, please join me in welcoming uh, Dan. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna try um, sharing my desktop and projecting here and we'll see. Um, hopefully everyone can see my title slide here. Um, maybe someone who has their video on can just give me a thumbs up if you do. Awesome, thank you so much. Okay, great. Um, so, so thanks very much for having me. Um, I'm excited to tell you about um, kind of two and a half projects from my lab thinking about um, the context in which um, toddlers uh, learn language. And the um, kind of take home message is going to be something like, um, when it looks like toddlers are being really smart, in part that's because they're embedded in contexts that are designed for them to be smart, because um, that's kind of how we want the world to work. We want toddlers to succeed. Um, and the idea is that if we want to think about kind of what toddlers are good at, it's worth thinking about the tasks that they're actually solving. So um, mostly I don't study vision, mostly I study uh, language. Um, if you don't, um, let me try to convince you a little bit that it's interesting. So um, here's a phenomenon I think about a lot, which is just how many words children learn kind of per unit time. So I'm showing you on the x-axis the uh, a toddler's age in months and on the y-axis, the number of words in their productive vocabulary. So this is how many unique words they know the meanings of. Uh, and this is just the 50th percentile child um, acquiring you know, nearly 1,500 words over the first two and a half years. Um, if you uh, need um, kind of a reference for scale, um, here at the 28 month mark is when this median child will be potty trained. So already um, knowing the meanings of almost a thousand words. So that's you know, pretty, pretty striking, I think. Um, so I came to cognitive development from computer science and kind of roughly coming in, this is sort of how I thought learning the meanings of words should work. So, um, you know, the toddler is embedded in some set of situations. Um, those situations are contexts, which are sampled in some way from, you know, the set of objects in the world somehow. Um, and what they're hearing are words, like basically captions for the context, right? And those words are um, derived from some abstract lexicon, which is a mapping between words and objects that they don't know. And the child's goal is roughly to do inference in this model and back out the lexicon, which is the, mean, the mapping between words and objects. Um, I should say this isn't only my idea, um, it's very much not. Um, uh, it owes a lot to work from um, Jeff Siskind and a bunch of others over time. Um, but what I want to do today is, is try to show you some ways in which this naive model is wrong um, in ways that I hope are motivating for, for folks thinking about um, how, how humans learn and maybe analogies that might have for how machines might learn um, in kind of vaguely human-like ways. So um, I'm going to uh, try to make basically two arguments to you today. One is that neither context nor words are IID nor stationary. Um, basically, the visual and linguistic input that children receive is goal-directed. It's not just kind of arbitrary samples from the world. Um, and often it's designed for communication and often with them in particular. And so that matters. Um, and the second is that learning language is really learning how to use language. And toddlers' successful communication depends a lot on their conversational partners who do interpretation of them. Um, and that ends up being a fair amount of heavy lifting. And so again, the take home here is that toddlers are totally good at the problems they have to solve. Um, it's just that the problems they have to solve are, are sometimes somewhat different than you might think they are naively. Um, and that's worth dwelling on for whether um, that might be relevant for machine learning as well. So uh, I showed up as a grad student um, at Indiana University to work with Linda Smith and Chen Yu. And um, we were doing um, you know, these studies empirically and building models of tasks where um, they're basically some finite number of objects and um, you hear a label for them and you're doing inference to figure out which object is being labeled by tracking the statistics of co-occurring words and objects over time. 
um, something like um, what you're seeing up there um, labeled B. And this paper from uh, Tamara Nicole Medina and uh, John Truswell and Lila Gleitman came out um, arguing that this is like a crazy way of thinking about word learning because the problem the child is solving doesn't look at all like that. And their example is um, what we've been doing is studying how you learn the word shoe in contexts like up, up top. But in fact, children are learning the word shoe from contexts like that bottom one. And wow, isn't that like a radically different, way richer, more complex con context? Um, and when I showed up in Linda and Chen's labs, they had just been starting to do this really elegant work, putting cameras on kids' heads and thinking about what the world looks like from their perspective. Um, and so having sat in on some of these meetings and you know, encoded some of these ideas, the first thing that occurred to me was like, wow, if you look at the kid here, actually, the learning problem is trivial. All they can see is the shoe, right? None of that stuff behind them matters at all. Um, that basically doesn't exist in the world for them in this moment. And so what we did was a study where we put cameras on kids' heads and brought them into the lab to play with their parents um, with some toys and then just tried to do the same kind of word learning task. So um, we have a, a playroom uh, in the psychology department at the time where parents and kids would hang out um, and just kind of warm up and play with toys while they got ready for whatever experiment they were actually supposed to do. And we just grabbed all of the toys out of this room and um, put them on the floor here um, and brought parents and kids in and said, you know, sort of, have at it, do whatever you want to do in this room with the toys. Um, and we just recorded it from a tripod mounted camera, which you'll see on the right, and simultaneously from uh, the head cam on the kid's head, which you'll see on the left. So let me just show you a clip of um, what these interactions look like. Yeah, yeah. It looks like a lion. It looks like a lion. No, it's a Rex Burger. It's a hippopotamus. Yeah, it's going to eat something. It goes, good job. Okay, so um, they're not all that cute. Obviously, I picked a cute one on purpose, but that's sort of roughly what the interactions look like. Um, and what we did was we used this paradigm developed by uh, Lila Gleitman and her colleagues that they call the human simulation paradigm. What we did is we um, clipped out the seconds of all of these interaction videos where parents used the natural language labels for the toys. Um, we muted the audio and we put in a beep at the time that the label was used. And we just showed these videos to undergrads in, uh, in our lab and asked them to guess which object was the target of the parent's reference. And so the idea here is all you're using is the visual scene that the child has access to. Obviously, you're not the child, but you know, it's a human simulation of the child's problem. So let me show you first here uh, what we think of as an easy naming event. And we think it's easy because when we showed it to 20 undergraduates, uh, they all got it right. So um, you can um, have a look. So what you're gonna see is a video, a muted video of some interaction. And when you hear beeps, those beeps correspond to uh, a label for one of the toys here. Okay, so if I quizzed you, probably most of you would guess that the tiger is the target there and that's right. Um, the tiger is what was said during the beep. Um, here's a hard naming event. Uh, we think it's hard because when we showed it to 20 undergrads, um, they disagreed a lot, um, a lot of them got it wrong, and there was kind of a wide set of objects that they thought might be the potential target of reference. Um, so here's this video. Okay, so some of you might think it's maybe Mickey, um, maybe some of you think it's the boat or the elephant or the top. Um, this one is Mickey, it turns out, but all of those look kind of plausible. Right, and so the question is, well, what fraction of the naming events that the child encounters are like that first one, pretty easy, where um, they're easy to guess, and what fraction are hard, like that second one? Um, it turns out the majority of them are pretty easy. Obviously, you're not children, you're using your you know, adult intuitions about um, how naming works and what the scene is like and so forth, but you, know, you don't have access to any of the language. All you're using is the visual environment. Um, and if you're an undergrad in our study, you guess correctly almost 75% of the time. So most of the naming events look pretty unambiguous. Um, we wrote the paper uh, about differences between the first person view and the third person view. I'm not gonna talk about that here um, in part because uh, you're gonna hear from Linda Smith this afternoon and she and Chen and other collaborators have done much more elegant work in this space using better paradigms for determining ambiguity. Um, I'm gonna tell you about something different which is the distribution of these events. So if you look at um, individual naming events and you look at what proportion of people guess correctly, what you see are these really bimodal looking distributions. So um, for both 12 and 30 month olds, some naming events are quite hard, almost nobody gets it right. 
And some naming events are trivial, right? And so the interesting question is when you get a naming event, um, is it randomly sampled from this distribution in an IID way, or is there structure over time? And it turns out there's this really rich structure over time. So I'm showing you here um, naming event number on the x-axis. So this is like for a particular child in their dyadic context. Um, the first time mom labeled tiger, the second time mom labeled tiger, the third time mom labeled tiger, and so forth. And on the uh, y-axis, I'm showing you the proportion of guesses that were in error. So this is kind of like inverse, uh, this is basically ambiguity. Up on this axis means more ambiguous. And what you see is that you don't get ambiguous naming events, even if you're an older kid early on in the encounter. What you get are um, highly unambiguous naming events where it's very easy to guess what the target is. You don't get complicated naming events like that second one I showed you until you've already established kind of common ground. Even for these objects that um, are probably known to the child, um, they just came out of our toy room, right? This um, two and a half year old probably knows um, boat and elephant, and we know that because they're talking about them with their mom. But even still, even for these known objects, it's just not how you communicate. Um, so for me, the insight was um, what we thought we would do is, um, here's a lot of toys, that's a lot of objects, it's gonna be pretty ambiguous. Um, what happens is parents get into this room and they take 22 of our 25 objects and they just shove them to the side, right? Because they know that you can't interact with your child around 25 objects, that's crazy. And so the environment just isn't the environment. Um, as we made it, the environment of the child's language learning is the environment that the child and the parent co-construct, right? And that environment has certain regularities that make it easier to learn from. So um, what I've tried to do here is just to give you a quick snippet of um, some work looking at the child's visual environment. Um, in a very particular kind of language learning case, um, you'll hear, um, I think, uh, more recent and better versions of this from, from Linda in the afternoon. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit now about the child's linguistic environment. So what we wanted to know was um, roughly, do parents talk differently to their kids about um, things that they think they know um, and things that they think they don't know? And um, so what we did was we wanted to get kind of more experimental control over this naming interaction. So the upside of um, the first project I told you about was um, it was really uninstructed. We don't know, you know, what parents and kids are gonna do. There's no particular goal given from us. They're doing sort of whatever they're doing, um, but we don't know which of those words kids know. We don't have much control over the goal and so forth. And so what we wanted to do is bring this into the lab um, even more so. So this, this is a project that's uh, led by my PhD student, Ashley Lung, um, in collaboration with Alex Tunkel, who was an honors student in my lab. So what we did was we brought parents and their kids uh, into a lab and uh, we had them just play a simple reference game. So you'll see a video in a second, but the child has an iPad that has three animals on it. And the parent's iPad will have a word on it, which is one of the animals. And their goal is to say sort of whatever they want to get their kid to pick the correct animal. So the target is cat, parents say whatever they're gonna say, um, kids tap on one of the animals, and they get this you know, pleasant reinforcing sound, whether they select correctly or not, right? So the game just moves on. Um, and what we were interested in is whether parents talk differently about um, the words that they think their cat might, uh, sorry, their child might know like cat versus words that they think their child might not know. So we selected animals in particular because we have a lot of data on the order in which children acquire them. Um, I'm showing you just a couple animals from the word bank data set, which is a project um, that uh, some collaborators and I have been doing for the last few years that collects a bunch of parent report data about which words kids know. Um, and so I'm showing you here the acquisition trajectories for the average child for these four words, dog, cow, squirrel, and donkey. Um, there's lots of interesting data here across linguistically and um, you know, with various demographic differences and so forth. But the point here is just dog is learned before donkey, we think a priori. So um, what we wanted to do was vary the difficulty of the animals and in expectation that parents might talk differently about them. So before parents came into the lab, about a week before, we sent them home uh, kind of a modified version of a standard survey that's used to estimate the child's total vocabulary. So it contains all kinds of words, arm and hammer and um, you know, refrigerator and so forth. Um, this is um, called a MacArthur Child Development Inventory. It's a standard instrument for trying to assess a child's vocabulary. And we embedded in this instrument all of our animals um, that we wanted to measure in our study. So the idea here was to try to get in you know, kind of a slightly surreptitious way, an estimate from parents about which um, animals they thought their children knew. So let me show you that data. Um, this is across the parents in our study. Uh, the proportion of them who reported that their child knew each of these particular animals. Um, so 
what you can see here is that every parent of a two and a half year old in our study thought that their child knew the word cat, um, whereas almost none of them thought their child knew the word swan. And um, you know, some animals were more in the middle, like rhinoceros and raccoon and so forth. So uh, the colors here uh, correspond to our a priori predictions about which words should be learned early versus late. So this was kind of um, you know, showing us that indeed we had constructed stimuli that varied in their age of acquisition. And so then we just looked at kind of what happens in the game when parents talk to their kid about um, cat versus when they talk to them about swan. So here's our prediction. Um, if parents referring expressions are calibrated to their children's knowledge, then they should produce more informative referring expressions for words they think their children don't know, because it should be hard for their kid to pick leopard on the basis of just the word leopard if they don't know what the word leopard means. Um, and then also, um, if parents are really modeling their children's language development, and they observe evidence that they were mistaken, like they thought their child knew the word leopard and it turns out they don't, um, then they should update their beliefs and behave differently the second time. So um, parents and kids played this reference game for each animal twice, and we wanted to look at what happens the second time. So again, let me just show you what this task looks like for a minute. Um, so this is a video of uh, a parent and her child doing just two trials of this task. Um, the first one's going to be about horse, the second one's going to be about leopard. Um, here's what it looks like. The okay, so you can see it's a pretty fluent interaction. Um, kids and parents thought it was fun. We sort of thought it was fun too. Um, and what we did was we measured a bunch of things about what parents said. I'm going to show you um, just maybe the most theory neutral, um, kind of easy to quantify measure of informativity, which is just how many words do parents produce? Um, and we measured just the words they produced before the child selected uh, the target animal. So um, like in that second case, you heard um, the mom say, where's the one that's like a cat? Then the child selected it and then she said, yeah, that's a leopard. But we're interested in just what she said to get the child to select correctly. Um, and the prediction here is that parents should produce more words, give more information for words that they, for animals that they think their child doesn't know the canonical English label. Um, we did our analyses in, in log scale length because um, length has kind of funny distributional properties, um, but I'm just going to show you length on the plots because um, it's easier to interpret. So uh, here's a plot of the proportion of children whose parents reported they knew uh, a target word on the x-axis and on the y-axis, the number of words parents produced on average to refer. And what you can see here is this really nice linear relationship between um, the probability that um, children in general were likely to know a particular animal and the number of words that parents produced. So what this shows is that um, parents have some sense of kind of how hard words are to acquire on average. So um, you probably, even if you're not a parent, have a sense that cat is an easier word than say swan. Um, and parents calibrate their references accordingly. So what this means is that kids are getting um, more informative referring expressions for words that they're kind of on average less likely to know. But what we wanted to know is over and above this kind of general calibration, do parents calibrate to their individual child? So over and above the fact that um, swan is a harder word in general, do parents calibrate to whether their particular child knows the word swan? Um, and so what we did was we um, regressed out that first predictor and then looked at whether uh, parents um, reported that their individual child knew an individual animal. And I'm showing you here individual parents in gray and the group average uh, in black with the error bars there representing 95% confidence intervals. And so what you can see here is that for animals that parents think their particular child knows, they produce shorter referring expressions than for animals that they think that their particular child doesn't. So you're getting calibration not just to kind of average difficulty of animals, but to the vocabulary knowledge of individual children, right? You're getting this incredibly sensitive um, calibration of linguistic input to what the child already knows, or at least to what the parent thinks the child already knows. But sometimes parents are wrong. And what we wanted to know was um, if parents observe that they're wrong, like they said whatever they thought they were gonna say for leopard, um, and then it turns out their child selected the donkey because they have no idea what leopard means, um, do they update their beliefs and response? And so um, what we did was we looked at what parents do the second time around for each animal. So here's the plot I showed you um, for, uh, again, for the first trial. So this is the first time uh, an animal, a particular animal is talked about. 
Um, this is the first time parents are talking about leopard or cat or swan or whatever. Um, parents produce more words for individual animals that they think their children don't know, and fewer words for individual animals that they think their children do. Here's the second appearance for each animal if, if uh, children were correct the first time around. So this is parents said whatever they were going to say, um, and then children selected correctly. You can see this looks a lot like the first appearance. So parents produce fewer words. There's like some kind of general calibration to the task, the interaction's getting smoother, but you still see this difference between known and unknown animals. Okay, but in contrast, if children were wrong the first time around, now known animals and unknown animals look identical. And that's because parents are treating known animals as unknown animals because they just thought they were known animals, um, but it turns out they're not, right? So we think this is super cool because it shows that parents are structuring the way that they talk to their children in a way that's exquisitely sensitive to what they think their children know, and further they update what they think their children know and they get evidence to the contrary. Um, so, you know, what's interesting here is that we don't think this is about teaching, right? The task isn't teach your kid what a leopard is. Um, that's not at all what's going on. Some stuff like that might be happening after their children select, but this is totally a reference game. Right? This is just produce information to help your child understand your communicative intention. The reason this is interesting for learning is that we think that communication and learning are um, pretty intimately related in, in the intuitive way that um, you probably are thinking, which is that it's much easier to learn from stuff you understand than stuff you don't. And so the idea here is by um, optimizing for this proximal goal of just communicating successfully, parents might nonetheless be structuring their uh, language that they're producing to children in a way that makes it easier for them to learn from it. Um, so I'm not gonna talk more about that now, um, but ask me about that um, later if you're interested. What I'm gonna do now is transition to a, a second project where we're thinking about um, not just how children learn words, um, but how they learn to use them to, to get stuff done. Um, so not just um, children's learning of language, not just the input, um, but their actual usage of language and how it works in communication. So um, this is a second project um, that's uh, in the canon of work that Ashley Lung is doing. Um, this one's in collaboration with Robert Hawkins, who's a postdoc at Princeton University. Um, so what we're doing here is we're thinking about the relationship between um, the meanings of words and the contexts that they're being used in. So the idea is um, if we're looking at these two things here and you want me to pick the object on the right, um, you're quite likely to say the word shoe because this is a shoe and that's a really good description of what it is that contrasts it with the chair, um, which is the other object, right? So if you said, find, find me the shoe, um, I'd be great at finding the shoe for you. Okay, in contrast, um, if these were the two objects we were talking about, um, now you wouldn't say find the shoe anymore. Shoe is now a very bad description of the object on the right because it's, um, you know, also a reasonable description of the object on the left. And so now you'd be more, much more likely to say, oh, can you find me the loafer? Right? Because this is a loafer too, as well as being a shoe. So what's interesting about this is if later on, um, you and I had this interaction with the two shoes and you asked me to find the loafer, if later on we had an interaction where we were talking about these two objects and you wanted me to pick the, the, um, the object on the right again, you'd actually be quite likely to keep calling it a loafer even though in this context, shoe would be perfectly fine and unambiguous. And that's because what we would have done is um, formed what's called a referential path. So this is kind of an implicit agreement between speakers that um, in this context, we're going to conceive of and talk about this object as a loafer. Um, we agree that this is a loafer and I'm gonna keep calling it that in the future. Um, but this is contextually bound and it's also speaker dependent. So if you and I might be calling this the loafer in this context, but if I went away and someone else came in and you were trying to get them to pick the shoe um, rather than the banana, you'd in fact call it a shoe. And this kind of flexible um, thinking about which uh, description is appropriate um, for which context with which speaker is like a hallmark of fluent use of natural language that um, human adults do just fine. Um, one way of studying this phenomenon um, is with a, a kind of matcher director game that looks kind of like the reference game I showed you earlier. Um, this is from a paper by Clark and Wilkes Gibbs. So the idea is um, there are two people, one is a matcher, one is a director, and the matcher sees some uh, order of these kind of novel tangram shapes, and the, direct, uh, the matcher doesn't, and the director's job is to use language to communicate to the matcher um, which object to put in which position on the screen. And so what we measure is what the director says um, when they're trying to get the matcher to pick. So, what you find is over repeated references to the same object, um, you get the formation of these kinds of referential paths. So what that looks like 
Um, here's one particular dyad in the Clark and Wilkes Gibbs paper. Um, the first time around, they're trying to pick out one of these objects. They say, all right, um, the next one looks like a person who's ice skating, except they're sticking two arms out in front. Um, okay, and then that works out okay. You can probably guess that that's object I. Um, the second time the same person refers to that one, they say, uh, the next one's the person ice skating that has two arms. The next time around, they say the person ice skating with two arms. And then they say the ice skater from that point on. Right, so they've converged on a shared agreement about what to call this thing in this context, um, totally from scratch. Right? And this is kind of a negotiation between the matcher and director, where both of them have input and both of them contribute to um, the ultimate decision to call this thing the ice skater. So it turns out children, in contrast, struggle a ton with this task. So I'm showing you here um, some kind of cute diagrams from a paper by Krauss and Glucksberg, which reports on um, a series of papers trying to investigate children's playing of this kind of game. So this is a, a game where uh, child one has uh, a kind of stack of blocks with pictures on them, and they're trying to communicate to child two which order to put their blocks in, except the pictures are these kind of weird abstract shapes. So it turns out children generate descriptions that uh, are kind of, you know, short and idiosyncratic and kind of a, not appropriate for a discriminative context. So um, here are some examples of uh, what children used as descriptions for these things. So, um, you know, this top one, one child calls man's legs. You could sort of see that. Another one says airplane. Another one says flying saucer and so forth. Um, but it turns out what child one says to child two just communicates no information to child two. And the way that you can see this is that children, even pretty old children, um, just fail miserably at this task. So um, the top line there is kinder pairs of kindergartners playing. There are six objects. And what you find is that um, they successfully pick the right block on only four out of the six trials, which is a chance. Um, sorry, they, they failed to pick the right object on four of the six blocks, which is chance behavior, basically. Um, so even with explicit um, instruction from an experimenter about, no, that's ambiguous, you should change what you say, um, kindergartners um, fail to do better over successive exposures. Third and fifth graders do better although only with um, experimenter intervention explicitly telling them how to be more efficient communicators. If you don't intervene, um, even eighth and ninth graders are not great at this task. And so the question we had was, well, you know, children talk to their parents all the time, and um, at least we think those are communications that go kind of okay, um, and they successfully refer to things and converge on an understanding of things. Um, might it be that what parents are doing um, is implicitly having strategies that, um, you know, ca capture some of what's going on in these experimenter, or explicit experimenter instructions, but just do it naturally by virtue of trying to communicate with their children who they know a lot about um, and who they're kind of doing some of the heavy lifting for in conversations. So we did a version of this same task where we brought parents and kids into the lab um, and we had them just play a simplified version of this matcher director game um, let me show you a short video of what this looks like. This one looks like it's laying down. This, this one looks like it's architecture. <laughs> uh, okay, does it look like it maybe has like a square and a triangle on the bottom? Well, yes. Yes. Okay. Okay, so this is like basically exactly what happens in the Krauss and Glucksberg study, except, you know, in, in real life without intervention. So um, the child looks at this thing and says, um, this one looks like it's architecture, which is like actually awesome. It's super cool that he generated that. Um, maybe he thinks this one looks like a tower, kind of, um, this, you know, object on the left here. But, but either way, mom is like, uh, I don't know, that's like a really abstract and hard to reason about reference. Do you mean the one that has a square and triangle on the bottom? And then they converge successfully, right? So um, this is an example of this kind of repair happening in real time. And it turns out these kinds of repairs happen um, across dyads. Um, so I'm showing you here um, four, six, and eight year old and eight years old, eight year olds and their parents playing this game and also um, pairs of undergrads as a baseline. So um, you'll see two things. One is that over development, you get more success. So four-year-olds and their parents are less good than six-year-olds and their parents. Um, 
but over um, successive repetitions on the same object, they get better. And also all of these are way better than chance, which is 50%. So um, broadly it works, even though kids seem to really struggle in this kind of game, um, presumably because parents are doing some of the work for them. Um, let me just show you what referential pack formation looks like. So here's adults. Um, and this basically replicates the Clark and Wilkes Gibbs study. So the first time around, they talk about a particular object. Um, I'm sorry, this is a number of words in the exchange on the y-axis. Um, you get fewer words over time. Um, here's one particular dyad. Um, so you'll see them converging on calling this um, particular toy, uh, sorry, this particular uh, tangram shape, the arrowhead one, um, over a series of successive references. Um, here are children and their parents for comparison. Um, so you'll see by the time uh, kids are eight, you get something that looks a lot like um, the adult behavior from both parents and kids. Um, but younger kids are kind of flatter. It looks like they're doing less of this convergence um, and then more of the work is being done by the parents. So the, they're successfully communicating because parents are doing a lot of reinterpreting and reasoning about what children say. Um, you can see an example of one four-year-old and their parent doing this task over four successive trials. Um, they switch back and forth. Um, the child is the director first and then the parent. Um, and you can see that they don't really ever, in this case, converge on, um, uh, on a particular referential kind of pact for, for this particular tangram, but um, you know, it works nonetheless, right? So they succeed anyway. So the um, final analysis I'll tell you about here um, is an analysis of where pacts actually come from. So for each particular tangram, it was talked about four times, switching back and forth between parent and child. Um, and so what we did was we looked at the last reference to each particular tangram. Um, I don't know if you can see my mouse pointer. Um, no, you can't. Um, on round four, um, we looked at the referring expression there, and we just um, went back, we unrolled back and looked at where those words came from. And so what we looked at was, um, did they come from the person who first generated a referring expression for that object, or did they come from somewhere else? What you're seeing here is that with pairs of adults, the final referential expression contains a lot of words which were first introduced by the original director. So the original director kind of set the rough parameters of what to call this, and then there was kind of convergence over time. Um, and children use a lot of the words their parents introduce, but parents don't use very many of the words that children introduce, especially parents of young children. It looks like what's happening is that um, Basically, children generate referring expressions that are not terribly good, and then parents kind of intervene on them to shape referring expressions that um, are usable for the dyads, um, but are coming predominantly from the parents. So what's happening here is um, communicative success, um, but it's driven by this dyadic interaction and not just by the child's capacities themselves. So um, just to wrap up here, the ideas I, I wanted to impart to you are that um, when you think about um, the kind of learning problem that children are trying to solve, um, it's pretty different from the one that at least I naively thought they might be solving in that um, neither words nor the context they occur in are kind of random samples of language. Um, and um, the use of language isn't um, just the child's own usage either. It's usage combined with um, interpretation and communication and scaffolding from their conversational partners who sometimes do a lot of the heavy lifting. So what looks like, um, really precocious use of language is in part precocious knowledge of how to use your language to communicate with people who know more language than you. Um, so that is to say toddlers are really good at solving the problems they have to solve, um, but those can be quite different from the problems that you might naively think they're trying to solve. Um, and that might be worth thinking about in a machine learning context too. Um, just to say two words about, you know, a reasonable objection to this is like, you're studying, um, you know, upper and middle class kids and their parents in, your lab, that's a pretty weird sample. Um, that's undoubtedly true. And um, the context that we're studying are undoubtedly culturally specific, like reference games and iPads and animal naming. And you know, in, in a sense, that's why we're using them, because um, those are contexts that the samples we're studying know how to interact in. Um, no question. But the idea is that the primary mechanism here um, is, is just communicative pressure writ large. Like it's just you, if you're trying to communicate with someone who knows less language than you and you know a lot about them, um, this is just how you should talk to them. And we think that's likely to be culturally universal um, for two reasons. One is that communicative pressure um, as a mechanism in formal models looks like it explains a lot about um, cross-linguistic regularities and language structure. And two is that um, it looks like in a variety of cultures and languages, um, not just um, you know, in my lab, 
um, but in other cultures and languages as well, um, language directed to children like by their caregivers and, and uh, older siblings rather than language that they just happen to overhear is the language that predicts their life. And so um, it's likely that these are the contexts in which language learning is happening. So with that, let me uh, thank my funders um, and I'll thank you all very much for listening um, and I'd be very happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, everyone, you can use your raise hand uh, to clap. Thanks. Um, okay, and uh, please uh, enter your questions or raise your hand if you would like uh, to ask a question. Oh, okay. Remove it if you're still clapping and then raise it if you want to ask a question. Um, so, um, yes, so this was, thank you for the very uh, interesting talk. Um, it's actually quite fascinating that um, it seems, and uh, if my interpretation of your, your talk uh, is correct, that we're kind of using our children, or it's useful to use um, previous categories that you've already learned to learn new categories, which is maybe not a surprising concept, but when we think of how we uh, ask our algorithms to learn new categories, we rarely ask them to learn, or we rarely present them with uh, data that um, kind of places new labels in relations with old things that they've already learned. And uh, I'm wondering whether this could be a, a strategy for training new algorithms that are uh, better by kind of relying on what they already know. Um, that seems totally plausible to me. Um, it's certainly the case that you know new knowledge is built on old knowledge and in relation to old knowledge and so forth. Um, there's there's work from other folks um, like Linda Smith, who you'll hear from later, has worked a lot on um, how um, children um, kind of learn over hypotheses from data. So um, you kind of um, you know learn how language works from language, and then you use how language works to learn new language. You learn how objects work from objects, and then you use that knowledge about um, objects to learn new objects and so forth. Um, it's certainly clear that kids do that. And I think folks have argued that some version of that might be responsible for um, one shot or you know, zero shot learning in humans. Um, my guess is that seems like it would be helpful in machines as well. Um, although you know, it might be if you have sufficient data, none of that matters. But um, if data is sparse, that seems like um, a, a useful strategy to me. Well, we have a question from the audience. Uh... Uh, I'm not sure how to unmute. Oh. I think I got it. Um, so, Mo Vigil, you're free to talk. Okay, can you hear me? I can, yeah. Okay, so, uh, my question is a very simple one. Uh, how the language or the knowledge acquisition differs from the infants uh, to the adults? Uh, in terms of guidance, for example, you uh, you present some of the experiment that uh, the parents guide the infants, uh, the children, uh, but uh, can the adult also guide the other adults uh, in uh, acquisition of the knowledge? And also the parents can guide uh, the children to uh, learn something new concept on language. So um, that's a great question. I, I'm not an expert in second language learning. Um, th the intuition here is that basically um, none of this seems like it's specific to parents and children to me. This seems like it's kind of a general problem of um, trying to communicate with someone who knows less language than you. In the kid's case, probably the kid also has a less um, you know, expansive conceptual repertoire. So um, you know, parents can be more flexible in how they like, reconceive things in that second game. Um, but, but my guess is that you, you see this kind of adaptation in general. I think in second language learning, um, it's harder because you um, learn from more people who know less about you. Um, and so, you know, presumably they can do less tailoring to you, but there's a whole field um, uh, in um, kind of psychology of um, psycholinguistics of language where folks are interested in what they call uh, listener design which is basically how speakers adapt their language for the benefit of the listener. Um, I think it's contentious sort of one option under what circumstances that happens, but um, some of it definitely happens. And my guess is um, it would be easier to learn a second language if someone were um, you know, trying to craft an experience which would be easier for you to learn from as well. Um, I, I would imagine. 
Um, I don't know how much of that is naturally occurring. Um, that would be cool to know. Um, it's a good question. Thank you. Thanks for the gift. Thanks. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time left uh, because we need to take a break, but I think, uh, Adam, you have one more question? Yes, yeah, just a quick question. Um, so on the topic of establishing referential pacts, I'm wondering if, if it's right to make a connection here to the development of a theory of mind where both parties need to sort of simulate each other's vocabulary, or is it more related to just the, the language ability of, of a child? Um, it's definitely related to both. So um, there's like a, a cluster of kind of, um, if you look at children's performance and sort of theory of mind related tasks, um, it sort of depends on the task and, and how you structure it and what the demands are, but you see a cluster of um, especially language related theory of mind tasks like implicature um, getting way better around the kind of four and a half, five, six year old mark. Um, and folks have argued that um, there's a real you know, intimate relationship between um, your kind of understanding of um, the kind of model of language in the world that your conversational partner has and your ability to you know, make referential facts with them, presumably because you need to know what other people are likely to um, understand about your reference and how they might model the object. Um, so I don't know if it's more related to language knowledge or, or theory of mind knowledge. They both seem pretty important to me. Um, one argument that folks have made about why kids fail in this task is exactly that it's a theory of mind failure. Kids know that they can conceive of, you know, whatever this weird thing is as daddy's shirt. Um, and don't understand that other kids might not conceive of it as daddy's shirt, um, because for them, that's like a perfectly good label for this thing. Um, I think that's totally possible, that, that a large chunk of what's going on here is, is um, you know, slowly developing ability to have a good model of other people's minds. Um, and, and that's what's responsible for this failure. Um, what's interesting is that um, it turns out only one conversational partner needs to model the other person's mind terribly well in order to get the task off the ground. Um, but I think those are intimately related abilities. Yeah, good question. Thank you. 